In pain and can't get to the gym, Arosti is here to get you back. Now available in the U.S. nationwide, Arosti offers Arosti Remote Recovery, an effective in-home treatment plan for muscle and joint pain, now at 50% off for our CrossFit community. Schedule a VIP virtual injury and pain chat to discuss your pain issues, receive an accurate diagnosis, and a personalized treatment plan at no additional cost to you. Schedule at arosti.com forward slash CrossFit dash recovery. That is arosti.com forward slash CrossFit dash recovery. Welcome back to the CrossFit Games podcast. I'm your host, Chase Ingham, with Mr. Adrian Conway, who's on vacation, brother. So thank you for taking the time to uh, hop on here because the last chance qualifier events are released. We have four of them. And the anticipation was what they're going to be, how many were we going to get. It's the same number as last year, but I would say it is a much different test than what was thrown out in 2021. It's a very different test. And, and to my opinion, you know, right out the gate with a general blanket statement, I love it. Um, mm. I think that, that we're looking at the bread and butter of what an athlete of this caliber who's made it this far has already shown that they're capable of. And now we're really putting it to the test in a very brief and concise uh, series of events. Talked to Adrian Bosman yesterday leading up to the release of the events as he went detail oriented of you know what they chose, why they chose, and how, how they decided to go with those. And a big word that kept coming up was simple. It's a simple test where the athletes are really going to almost design this event by themselves as opposed to the event really dictating what happens beyond that. Explain for, uh, for those that don't really understand that wording of the athletes almost dictating what the test is going to do rather than the test dictating what the athletes are going to do. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's our ability to now compare ourselves to almost all sports out there, right? Like we have this really beautiful and elegant theme of our sport and, and training methodology of constant variance. Um, and sometimes we're so drawn to that as a crowd or as a viewer that we're like, okay, give me the most fancy and the sexiest and the coolest and the hardest and most difficult workout that you got so I can be so thoroughly entertained. <laughs> and now it's almost like we've, we've established this test that looks a lot like, you know, a running a 400 meter. Okay, mm. now we're all going to do a standardized long jump. Okay, now we're all going to do, right, it's kind of like the decathlon type of measurement uh, yeah, yeah. In, in a CrossFit style test. And I think that's okay because – you know, we're, we're in a place now where it's like, okay, athletes have the opportunity to show us what they're capable of and, and their variations or the, the variance of skill level and or capacity will be what then dictates who gets to punch a ticket to Madison. And a lot of times when we look at, say, analyzing a, a programming set, whether it's, you know, six events, four events, 15 events, is the first thing we need to look at is what's the purpose of the test before we start to analyze the the test itself? And we look at the last chance qualifier. It's a, it's exactly how it sounds. These are athletes last chance to qualify for the CrossFit Games. And it's about 30 plus athletes between the men uh, for the men and for the women, give and take a couple, depending on who actually Decides to sign up for the test. Not everybody has officially signed up. So if you guys look at the leaderboard on games.cross.com, it is not fully listed out because they're only listing the athletes that have registered. Now, that doesn't mean anything here or there other than the fact that they're just waiting to put their name in, in, the, in the hat officially, but it doesn't mean they're not signing up to do it. Um, we'll pull up the list that the game site put on their Instagram, and then you see a full list of what that's going to be. But when you look at the test itself, we've had the open, we've had quarterfinals, we've had semifinals. And this is that fourth, basically funnel or filter one final time to get to the cross at games. And we see the breadth of tests they've already had, because listen, people might not think the open counts, but it does. It was stage one. Stage two is a quarterfinals, which had six tests. Stage three is the semifinals, which had another six. So you look at 15 events to get these athletes here. Now, what are we looking at with this field and these tests to get to the CrossFit Games? Yeah, to me, when, when you think about this, this, and, and I mean, I don't even think that this is the direction of this question that you asked for ne necessarily, but to me, this speaks to almost the necessity of CrossFit really being hands-on at the semifinal level. Mm. And I say that because I can only imagine how difficult putting together these four scored events had to be when your ultimate goal is to now put together a very complete test. We have, from a strategic standpoint, tested these athletes in many different forms throughout the season already, but this has to be 
the the tip of the cusp, right? Like this has to be the tip of the spear in regards to what punches that ticket for all these athletes that have had a lot of them a very diverse test from from different you know aspects because they had six different events at the semifinal level for the most part, at least four. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that would make it a little bit more convenient. When I do look at these four events, I think that there's a really unique combination of simplicity because of course couplets across the board aside from the triplet um simplicity in the movements um i think it's very easy to to judge because we know that's a very key topic uh in in this season specifically in 2022 and i really love that the aspect of the challenges uh that present themselves in the regards to the time domains and the loading right there's not a wonder at max max lift but right. man dude these these, these <laughs> 185 pounds and 125 pounds as a thrusser. <laughs> right. Come on. And it's then, not like know, it isn't getting tested this weekend. Right. At 225 and 155 for all those clean and jerks. So I, I'm a huge fan. I really love how everything seems to be merged and blurred together with skill set and capacity. And it's going to make, I mean, listen, because the test is so good, I'm like, oh, how can we, <laughs> how can we get this covered? How can we cover <laughs> this in some way? Right, right, right. And I like what you said there because I said in a, in a blanket statement, they've taken 15 tests to get to this point. And that's not necessarily true. I mean, they all took 15, but they took 11 of the same tests and everyone took four different ones, depending on which semifinal. And you brought up an interesting question and topic, which is, you know, I want to expand on a little bit. And this is, this has been happening since really the 2010 regional era where everyone programmed on their own. And then we had basically seven to eight years of standardized programming across the regionals from 2011 to 2018 come 2019 to this point different semifinals get to program their own test per se with this you're having two standardized events from hq but i like what you said here is that it almost makes programming this this set this section of the competition a little bit more difficult because all these athletes took a different test to get here. Yeah. So to me, you know, when we think about this, if we look back at the story that this whole season tells us is that a lot of these athletes that we're about to watch or about to see the events, you know, scores and videos submitted, uh, they were seconds out and, and points out, which are sometimes even fractions of a second in particular workouts. And a lot of these athletes, their limitations were, on the workouts that weren't the legless rope climb, rope climb run or the clean and jerk complex. And so it might've been something like a miscue on a handstand walk after you just did a ton of thrusters mm-hmm. or, you know, a, a local muscle endurance issue on a long chipper where it went deadlifts, sandbag cleans, hang power cleans, like all in a row or something. So because of that, you really can't pinpoint like, Oh, this was a really big blockage point for this group of athletes. How can we test that? Or how can we retest this? It has to be something that the programmer does have in consideration of, wow, there's, there's a lot of holes within this group, potentially, mm-hmm. um, that are very diverse. So how do we allow the cream to rise to the, to the top and make sure that the best two men and the best two women are the ones that get an opportunity in, in Madison? Basically, you have 10 sets of two or three athletes that all got here a different way because right, right. of the different programming across the semifinals. And it's a debate that's been going on for a couple of years in this new format, especially is that should or shouldn't you standardize all the events during the semifinals? And, you know, you and I both grew up in the age of it was standardized. And there's I feel like there's always two groups when it comes to that. And there's not a lot in between where. They want to go back to standardize because you look at the test itself. You almost take the emotion of viewing these things over and over to get a good idea of everyone walked the same path to get to the top of the mountain. And others that I think more comes to the fandom side, and athletes also feel differently about this as well, where they like seeing all the different tests. And as a programmer and a fan, I do dig it. I like seeing all the different ideas, all the different venues and what they did with maybe the landscape of which their semifinal was at and vice versa. I like that. But from a objective point of view and for us as analysts, I do like there being a single linear path to the CrossFit games. And you're right. When you look at the last chance qualifier, there was a different path that 10 groups took to get here before we funnel one more time into the CrossFit games. And I don't know. It's like, I'm still a team standardized programming. I don't know where you sit. 
Yeah, I, dude, and I'm, I'm telling the line and I, and this year has answered some questions for me that I had in my mind. Um, for me going forward, I would honestly say I prefer the standardized test across, right? All mm -hmm. semifinals. And it is hard for me to say, because as a programmer, like you shared yourself, Chase, is I really appreciate looking at a test that was designed by a particular group and thinking about the whys and the hows and the nuances that they wanted to explore and the rep schemes and all of it. I think and love that as a student of the game and a nerd of exercise science <laughs> and fitness in general, but from a convenience standpoint, again, me being able to step into the role that you've been able to serve in so many years, like I'm seeing this from a completely different perspective. Like, dude, that makes this job really hard. You yeah. Know? Um, <laughs> yeah. And then also thinking about the judging issues and the, the standard, the standardized mm -hmm. or the inability to standardize there for them and have those repetitions in their eyes, even from watching online, maybe the week before their semifinal goes or whatever it might be that really could refine us as a sport and make us better. To me at this stage, I think it might serve us better to go back to that old school way of like, hey, these are the six. Let's see who, who punches their ticket. And that, that's your analyst hat. But go to the other side is, is what about the competitors? Do, is that something that you would look at as maybe you're in the semifinal and you see what you get and then you look maybe a week from now at the other semifinal in North America, because it is the same grouping where, you know, like what happens in Copa Sur has no effect on what you had, but you could still be like, man, if I was over there, I'd have a much better shot just based off the events that were programmed. I mean, I feel like that's just a, almost a natural instinctual way to look at some of these things. How, how do you look at that from an athlete's perspective? Yeah. And, and I think it's both. I think it's both. I'm, as a competitor, it's super easy to look across the ocean or to look across the region and be like, you know what? If I even had those same six workouts against that group of guys, like I'm third easy mm -hmm. on a bad day, right? Yeah. Or a bad weekend. And then look across the, the region in another direction and honestly be like, dude, those six, I'm really lucky I didn't get two of those tests because that would have been a nightmare, <laughs> right? Um, but one of my biggest issues with the standardized program across all six is that if you are the latter part of the semifinal season and yeah. you're the final week, for example, it's really hard for me psychologically to practice enough and not overdo. Yeah. Um, and this is where of course, leadership and guidance and coaching on the athlete side is, is certainly fruitful. Uh, but dude, it's so hard when you've known the workouts <laughs> for like seven stinking weeks right. and you're just like, okay, <laughs> I'm over here trying not to kill myself. But also, I need to take this test several times so I have the greatest right. advantage possible. Yeah. So to me, that was always the hardest battle. Is if I'm towards the end and all the workouts are the same, I'm like, great. I got to pretend I don't know these for a few weeks or I'm gonna, <laughs> it's going to be bad. I, I can totally see that. Well, let's look at the last chance qualifier itself. We have four events that were released yesterday. The last chance qualifier will be underway Wednesday starting at noon Pacific time. And it all starts with a couplet. As workout number one, there you are, little guy. Man, when, when I first saw this come out, I was like, there's one you read on paper, and then there's things you see in person, and then there's one that you know on paper it's going to be great and you can't wait to see in person. And I feel like this is one of those. So you have a two-minute running clock. It'll start off with 20 thrusters at 185 for the men, 125 for the women. And then in the time remaining, max bar muscle-ups. And the bar muscle-ups will be score, scored for total reps. Once the two minutes is up, you'll take a two-minute break and then hit the next section, which this one will flip the movements. 20 bar muscle-ups, and in the time remaining, max reps thrusters at 185 and 125. And, I mean, Adrian, your first reaction when you saw this one come off, come off the press my first thought was nice flex Adrian Bosman. <laughs> I mean, straight up, bro. I'm like, okay, we're, we're, we're really starting to see the fruits of him getting creative and being in his bag. And I know there's a team behind this as well, but to me, I'm like, Oh, this should, this should scare the guys that have already qualified just a little. <laughs> um, because if this is any inkling at the type of testing capacity that we're going to ask and demand of the community that showed up this year, like we're in for a show and I look at those thrusters and I'm like, okay, this loading is not unfamiliar. We did see this last year um, through all division, or at least even through the 35 to 39. Like we had 
thrusters at 185 and 125 here. Um, but it's not just that. It's to see them in this go big or go home, literally, style mm-hmm. of programming where in a two-minute window, you got to bang those third 20 thrusters. It's not like you really have an opportunity to make a lot of decisions based on convenience or fatigue. Like you just have to say like, how bad do I really want to make it to the CrossFit games this year? Um, and, and you're going to have to hold onto that bar for something that is terribly uncomfortable. Um, and then find a way to bang out a few bar muscle ups. Cause that's your score, right? Like that's all. Right. Oh, I did 20 thrusters. And by the way, zero, here we go. Now it's time to do. <laughs> right. That's a hell of a buy-in. Oh my goodness. What a buy-in. So I, I loved it, man, when I saw this. And then of course that two minute window in the middle, you know, that's a, that's a place that is a really scary place for an athlete that doesn't train um, mm-hmm. in these two minute all out intensities often, because yeah. I think we see that in a lot of camps where people are very drawn to volume, very drawn to doing a lot of work, but not necessarily that crazy high intensity, which is the most uncomfortable to chase um, because in that two minute window, like you're like, wait a second. I thought, I'd, I thought I'd feel different at the end of this. Right. And then you're like 20 bar muscle ups are feel like almost something foreign when you're like normally doing 20 unbroken, no problem at this level. So I love this workout because of those things. And the, because of the psychological challenge that is brought with these windows here. And the dirty trick here is that, okay, you have those 20 in the beginning and the balance of, okay, do I need more time or do you, I need more energy? Right. Do I take a break on the thrusters, sacrifice some time on the back end, but get to the bar muscle ups fresh? Well, okay. So maybe that's the decision I make. Now the decision is how hardcore do I go on the bar muscle ups when it comes to that? Because I have to turn around in two minutes and go back to the bar muscle ups. And sometimes I feel like people get so consumed with like, okay, I'll do max bar muscle ups and I'll do some because I got to focus on the thrusters. Like, no, you basically have. But two minutes, two and a half minutes of straight bar muscle ups with a two minute break in between the way this is set up. Yeah, it's the the way it's set up is again like it's it's a very challenging deal. Cause I, I think there's gonna be some taller athletes that are gonna struggle with the thrusters just from a cyclical aspect. It, it's gonna slow them down a bit. Those are the ones that almost have to go a little faster and take more chances because the shorter athletes that are strong enough are gonna get to that bar muscle up much quicker. And yes, a two minute break you're right into another 20 bar muscle ups and yeah, it's going to feel like back to back coming off that. And then you got to find a way to, to bury yourself under some more thrusters to finish the finish within that six minute window there. So we're looking at those one and it's always a game you like to play is that I'm trying to figure out what a good score is going to be when you, when you look at this overall, because you're going to take the bar muscle ups you get in the first two minute window plus the thrusters you get in the second two minute window. And I mean, you could see athletes with as little as 30 or 45 seconds to as much to the opposite is almost maybe like 90 seconds. Well, I mean, not 90 seconds on the thrust one, but like a minute Mm -hmm. to a minute 15. I mean, someone's going to walk out. I mean, there are athletes that can walk out there and throw down 20 in a row. Mm-hmm. on the thrusters okay yeah, we you know, get we, 15 maybe now what do you do <laughs> right right and and that's why i think it's it's such a well-balanced event right is because there, there's going to be some outliers and we can pick out a few names probably from the male side or the female side um where 20 unbroken thrusters is possible uh i don't know that most of the athletes that are punching their ticket are going to rack off 20 in a row to be honest with you, right? When I think about the athletes that I think could punch a ticket, I'm thinking they're going to probably go like 15 and five or 12 and eight, and then get to the bar with a little more energy with a little less time to bang up those bar muscle ups with less of a transition versus the athletes that do go 20 and unbroken. They might have to take that pause. You know, it might get a little elongated and then they're up to the bar and it's really going to end up being sixes (laughs) if you move (laughs) right, you know, for both. So um, it's, it is, it's going to be, it's, it's really going to come down um, to, I mean, I think, I think this workout's going to be like with it, you're going to see 10 reps for, you know, like, <laughs> uh, like 20 of the spots is, is within 10 reps of each other. Yeah. That's how yeah. this is going to be a very close call because of that. I almost think you're going to see something similar as like the rep scheme buy-ins may be what those max reps will look like in the time remaining. I mean, 20 bar muscle ups after doing 20 thrusters at 185 and 120 and 125 to go into bar muscle ups again 
I, I think 40 plus is probably going to be what it takes to get maybe a top 10 finish and maybe 50 plus is where you want to be taking an event total reps combined. Yeah, I think, I, I think it's doable. I, I, man, 40 plus. I'm I just, I get so surprised with the freaking level of athletes mm -hmm. like these guys are. Cause oftentimes re recently I've undershot their abilities, but man, I'd be curious. How many, how, okay, say we've got 30 men, 30 women. How many you think got a shot at getting 40 plus? 10% or 30%, 10, 10 athletes in each one. Maybe I think 50 six. plus is going to win it. Yeah. Maybe six. Man. I think there's maybe six athletes that can do that. And this is cause I think that's, that's pretty high, particularly on the back half. Right. So yeah. I definitely don't think that they're getting 20 thrusters at 185, 125 on the back half of this workout. Okay. That's, yeah. that's the, that's the deciding fact. I think, I think they could bang the 20 and potentially be getting 15 bar muscle ups plus there for sure. Cause once they get up there, they're just going to hang on for the remaining time. But right. th I think that back half is where it's like, Oh, they get through the 20 bar muscle ups. Cause a lot of them are going to have the capacity to do that. Then they go to pick up that bar and, and especially <laughs> if they went 20 on the first half, they're going to get to like five on this load on yes. that back half. And it's going to be like a quick drop. And then they're going to yeah, be like, Oh point. no. Right. Yeah. So I think yeah. that they'll just lose a, a significant amount of time on this. This I mean, time. I can see, I can see 15 to 20 on the bar muscle ups in the first section. And then you just have a two minute break to do 20 more after that. So yeah. How are those thrusters? How's that lockout going to be after 40 potentially right. more muscle ups, with just a two minute break in between. It's really where it gets a little sketchy because you just can't bring that same speed through the middle on the thruster with that, with that loading after you've got so much fatigue and you need triceps, you need that ability <laughs> right. to press it out. Right. And that's, that's where it really gets nasty. Yep. I, I, and one of those things that some people probably don't see is the, I mean, I have almost failed lockouts on bar muscle ups before because of tricep fatigue and to have that in the middle at the end, you're right. I think that last set of thrusters is going to, I mean, I don't think I'm going to, I'm not too proud or too proud not to do uh, clusters. I'm just going to say, <laughs> yeah, Hey, uh, and seriously, I mean, we might see athletes at the end of their ability to press it out at the end of the workout where I still need another rep or I right. Like I got to keep fighting. What I really love though, Chase is to think back to the open. Think about the way we came off those 15 bar muscle ups and we saw some of the fittest people in the world get to 135 on the thruster and stick it hard like they're like, Ugh! right? Yeah. So this, is a, this is a whole different ball game now with 185, 125 overhead. Very different stimulus, but very similar. So I, I like the, the tie too. Yeah, that is, that is a good callback. All right. So as you move from workout number one, we move to workout number two. And as a, uh, a more rowing proficient human being. I had like that little Grinch smile come across my face when I saw this one get released. And it's a 2000 meter row for both men and the women. And in the time remaining a max distance handstand walk with the time cap for the men as eight and the time cap for the women as nine. And for me, I feel like the hardest part of designing this one is choosing the right time cap. What is it about the time cap that actually makes this the, almost the more important thing to get right other than, say, the distance on the row? Um, you know, it's, it's the psychological effect on the athletes, you know, because what you, what you don't want is if you give the, the men and the women both another minute per se, um, what's going to happen there is they're going to start to recognize that the juice isn't worth the squeeze on the row. And so they're going to hold back more, right? Like you can, and I said this to someone on social media already about this workout, you can't necessarily win the workout on the road, but you can lose it there. <laughs> yeah. But the ironic thing is that with, with a, with a greater time cap, you can even be more conservative and hold back a little bit of that suffering because mm -hmm. we know this. And if and we're really speaking from an experienced athlete's perspective here, if you row a 145 pace versus a 141 pace for a two <laughs> pay, uh, yeah. right? Like you're like, Oh man, that's a significant more amount of effort. Mm -hmm. but it's not a ton of time difference if I have two and a half more minutes to work, right? Cause you can make up that what ends up being 22 seconds when it, with, within that two and a half minutes of work most often. Right. But when the, when the time cap is shortened and now you have to make these reckless and dangerous decisions <laughs> on the lower yeah. because you can't make up 
only 15 seconds, right? Mm -hmm. Within a, maybe you're going to get 90 seconds to hand send walk or whatever it might be the way it's going to play out. And I, I think that's the, the real important part of them making this selection is that it, it changes dramatically the amount of risk that you have to put behind your rowing efforts on that 2k than just being able to conserve it and say, oh, I'll make up, I'll make up the ground on the handstand walk. I love that. I love the time cap. You, you're right. If it was nine for men, it's a buy-in. It's almost, it's not even, it's not even a format. It's like, it's, that's not even hard. Like I, it now makes the row borderline irrelevant, at least on the men's side, I would say if they had nine minutes to do this, because okay, I'm going to get off the row refresh. And then so say for a minute and 45 seconds, because like you rowing a 7.15 2K versus a 7 minute 2K, as you said, feels almost different worldly as far as effort and fatigue. But this is, I look at this as who can row the easiest, for, say for the men, 7 minute 2K. And then how, how can you do the easiest way with a, with sixty seconds of, you you don't come down other than just to turn around, on, on the handstand walks on on the women's side. What you're probably looking at, throw another five seconds per five hundred pace on there, so maybe yep. seven twenty even. And now actually, I could see the women getting more time on mm -hmm. the handstand walks than the men. Obviously, they have a minute um, more right. to do that. But I mean, even like a seven thirty row for the women is, is nothing just to like pass off as as nothing when it comes to that but uh the the best approach to this say say for an athlete coming into this uh, and it, this is almost a tale of two different athletes a lot like you see saw in event one right usually your bigger taller athletes aren't the best upside down and vice versa where your shorter more gymnastic would prefer not to sit on the rower for two thousand meters yeah, and, and I think that's the beauty in the handstand walk is that I don't I don't really know that there's as much of a preference as if we were coming off this this rower and doing strict handstand push-ups. And I say that because a lot like running or walking in space, the longer levers, while uh, commonly like in a small box or have to travel a greater distance, in mm -hmm. this instance, they're literally traveling a, traveling a distance. So mm. the, the taller athlete can still have just as much of an advantage if they're as skilled because – their hands do travel further per step probably uh, because their hand or their shoulders further removed from the ground than the, than the shorter athlete. Yeah. Right. So I do think that this can be a taller athletes workout if they're proficient enough, which that'll be the story that we get to learn as we watch the workout yeah. play out, of course. Um, but yeah, I really think it's like how confident are you on your hands under a ton of fatigue and not just that, but how fast can you move? Um, because if you kick up and you got the confidence to be there, but you're kind of shaky and not really traveling distance. And then someone kicks up 10 seconds after you, like if you could, if you could both have that 45 seconds left to work or one minute left to work, it's, you're probably going to get passed up. Right. And it was that 10 second faster pace worth it because worth, worth you it. said right. the 2k. So it's a, it's a one forty five versus my one forty seven one forty eight. I will happily row at a 147, 148 to feel like I feel yep. in the sub 145 pace. It's amazing how, how much that adds up. And as you said, the juice worth the squeeze. I think in these middle two events, event two and event three, and we'll, we'll hit event three in a set in a, just a second is that you can point to it and be like, this does favor say an athlete that has this skill set with the caveat of as long as they have the fitness to utilize, say that, that advantage so it's like oh well they're just tall so they're going to be great at this event it's like no you can't just fake this event oh right it's like you can take advantage of maybe the small advantage you may have physically but you won't be able to be successful if you don't have the fit fitness to back it up we're in event one it's a tale of two athletes right and in the middle right the perfect crossfit competitor will be better than both extremes between the strong and the gymnastics one so in this event too i see the same thing is there may be an advantage size wise, but it's not just because you're tall or because you're big and powerful is that you better have the fitness to back it up. Yep. Yeah. And, and I see, I honestly see, even if we go back to workout one, when I think about that, the tail two athletes deal, if it was a different movement than bar muscle ups, I would agree more that it was a tail two athletes, but like mm -hmm. I'm over 200 pounds. I don't think about doing 20 unbroken bar muscle ups on. I think about it. I yeah. get up there and do them. And, and I think most of the athletes at this point feel that way. Now, if it was ring muscle ups, at this point in my conditioning and skill set level, uh, yeah. I would think about that. 
So if it was thrusters and ring muscle-ups, I think it, it's certainly a tail to athletes. But because it's bar muscle-ups, I still think it favors the athlete with the highest power output more than anything. Um, and, of course, for a strict handstand push-up, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> right? 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 Like right, wall right. walks, which is what we did see those heavy thrusters with at the games last year. Because in my mind, I was like, okay, these heavy thrusters, no problem. Like, I'll, I'll suffer through these. And then the wall walks for me felt like a tremendously different task <laughs> yeah. after right. that. And the athletes, you know, I got beat by a couple athletes that were just cooking me on the wall walks every time. And just like the time discrepancy between how long 10 thrusters at 185 will take Definitely. and how long 10 wall walks at Definitely. 185 will take. Yep. That's, uh, yeah, I, I like what you said there. All right, so let's move from event two to number three. And this is another couplet with an ascending rep scheme, one up to 10 of clean jerks at 225. If you guys are just listening to the podcast, Adrian is now smiling ear to ear <laughs> in 155 for the women. And then the shuttle run is back because F you, that's why. <laughs> because just because you guys can't get it right doesn't mean that they shouldn't put it in there. Hey, and listen, we're bipedal. We should be running, right? Like, hey, if you want to find the fittest human, and I love that they've broken the seal with this, right? It's about time we got running in an online format that is, uh, you know, conceivable for the general public to do. It doesn't have to be that we measure out 400 meters like they did when the CrossFit Games first stage was an online qualifier or anything like that. This is just a shuttle run, and I would believe that people need to get ready to be dosed up. Because if you want to consider yourself one of the fittest in the world, you better be able to move your body from A to B. So <laughs> I, I, I certainly love this, but I will say, man, if I could pick a workout to do, I'm like, throw me in this one. I want to <laughs> give it a try. Right. And and I love yeah. the loading. Man, this is just it's brutal though, because I really think, and, and you alluded to this even on your last point, Chase, about the the wall walks that we were just mentioned, was that you know, time matters and time mm -hmm. under tension matters. And it's like, you can't just look at these shuttle runs. Like, well, I'm going to go hard on the barbell and recover on the runs. Like now, man, in those latter rounds, when you're running seven and more shuttle runs, you're spending a lot of stinking time out there. Yes. You got to go. Yes. And so that's why I really love this combination of both loading and the time that you're spent. spending. I think running. a lot of people, just as you said, are looking at this like, okay, hammer the clean and jerks, maybe unbroken for as long as I can. And then I'll do singles when I have to, and then recover on the runs is like, maybe through five but once we get to six seven eight those shuttle runs have a massive time suck when it comes to that and what we mean by time suck is that there's a lot of opportunity to just bleed time you'll see that on like massive sets of burpees where if you just have a little bit of a hesitation to get back to the ground and say a set of hundred like you can lose two minutes on something like that. And when you look at six, seven, eight, nine, ten, those shuttle runs are going to take a, a very serious amount of time. In fact, I would say they're going to take much longer than the clean and jerks would at these weight. Yeah. Let me tell you something. If someone is doing touch and go clean and jerks in this workout, I might think about smacking them if I physically could. <laughs> I'm not saying that's the best idea. Yeah. yeah <laughs> because it's, just like, like, math, right? All right, it's my turn. Yeah, it's a 20 minute time cap. If you don't finish this workout, you don't belong at the games anyways. Mm -hmm. It's 55 reps. Don't you dare. You know, man. Oh gosh. It's, it's 55 reps. It, it don't even it's like double, it's almost double grace at this particular loading. And mm -hmm. we go back and even think about the greats in our sport, like Mr. Rich Froning, who finished the CrossFit games in a very elegant fashion with the old, you know, double grace. Yep. And he did all singles the whole way, you know, at like 35, you know, <laughs> at 135. Right. So take, right. A, take a lesson there and just know that it's, it's, it's more important how fast you get your hands back to the bar versus really controlling it down to the ground. It's super rare that the juice is worth the squeeze unless it was only like one, two, three, four, five, maybe then I'm, then I'm with it. Right. Um, but yeah, dude, I, I love this. And I think that, yeah, it's going to catch a lot of people off guard on how long they're out there for that run. Well, I guess at this point too, everyone did get that experience at the quarterfinal level where they were like, whoa, there was a good bit of running there yeah. uh, when I was away from that wall ball and the rope climb uh, in that particular event. So I think they'll have that expectation. But if you guys are listening to this and you're just ready to throw down with some bros out there, don't be, uh, don't be mis <laughs> misguided about these runs. Like they're the real deal. You got to get after it on them. And the other trick here is the ascending rep scheme. It's really easy to look at this and not really see the totality of, of the, the test in front of them because you're not halfway until you're almost halfway through the round of seven itself. And then you're getting the next half in just three sets after this. What, 
how much does just the switch of one to 10, 10 to one impact of an, an event like this? It's a ton within your mind because you just feel like you're going so fast and you are, you're like, Oh, I'm killing it. I've done six rounds. Here we go, baby. <laughs> right. But then you're like, wait, a, you know, I'm you're four talking. minutes in, ain't nobody going to touch me. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Like, you're like, you're, 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 your judge tells you how much time yeah. has passed and you're like, Oh my goodness. How's it taken these guys, you know, 17 minutes i'm gonna 20 cry. minute time gap what this is i'm almost done and then all of a sudden you get halfway through that round of eight and you're like okay mm -hmm. i get it now okay I'm, I'm i still got you know 24 repetitions to go i'm i'm barely halfway um I, I love that and i think we've seen this a few instances throughout this season where there's a play on reps a little different than we commonly might see in a class structure or on dot com or even historically in regionals and I, I love that because I think as an athlete and as a viewer of the sport and as a coach too, it's like, it's important for us to feel challenged in different ways other than add more weight or add more reps. And this is a great way to do that. The 225, the 155, as we said on the row event in the previous one is that this is one for the bigger, stronger athletes. When you just look at the weight, you look at the volume of clean and jerks. Yes. There is an advantage there if you are, say, a bigger, stronger, more powerful athlete. However, just because you are that person, you still need to have elite work capacity and conditioning to be successful at this one. And when you when you look at this, especially in the order of which they go, I think this is a different this is a different event completely if we go 10 to 1. Abs just it's not even the same thing, even though it's basically the it's same reps, it's the same volume, but no one is going to be able to fake their way through this just because they're good at one thing. No, no, not at all. And, and that's the reason it's not just a wonder max clean and jerk. Right. And I think that's the beauty and the, a big part of, for our, for our aspect or the aspect of our sport for the viewers to really grow in their maturation when they think uh, one, think about what you say before you say it, of course, but it's like sometimes people throw out these accusations or assumptions and it's just like, you clearly haven't done a workout like this ever in your life <laughs> or, or done it competitively, maybe without scaling it or right. Like, cause there's, there's assumptions that people make, well, like, you know, why not just do a wonder max clean jerk? And it's like, well, you go do this workout and then you tell me why, because you'll know the answer. Um, mm -hmm. cause it's a completely different test and it can reward the stronger athlete, but how proficient are they? How well do they recover, um, through something like a run where they do have to push to place and it's not just something they can walk or leisurely jog, uh, cause that, that'll change it tremendously. And I, and I'd argue that the strongest athlete in the field certainly won't be the one that wraps this up with a W on this particular event. Absolutely. Absolutely. There with you. So three down one more to go and a direct contrast maybe to what we've seen up to this point for workout number four we have two rounds four time 50 burpee box jump overs at 24 and 20 inches 75 double unders and then 100 wall ball shots at 14 and 20 pounds to thank you thank you thank you everyone goes to a 10 foot target of which they deserve to go to and <laughs> I think a lot of people initially are like 200 wall ball shots. And then I'm like a hundred burpee box jump overs. <laughs> that's the number that's jumping off the page to me. That's the, that's the number that jumps off the page to me. That's the number that is the separator of this workout. That is the number, my man. I, I, I can't, I can't echo it enough that the transition and an athlete's ability to really stay the course with whatever rhythm or tempo that they desire to have in this workout for that is to me, the, what's going to dictate success. Um, and, and, it, and it, the two rounds for time is, is a nasty way to lay this out because it could be a, a slug fest and they could have went 100, 150, 200, right? One time through yeah. traditional chipper style. Yeah. But I yeah. like this because we're going to see faster times it, with, with it being staged this way, right? We know that that brief break from these movements is going to allow the athletes to come back and attack them. But I'll say after 98, 99 100 when the wall ball hits the target for that 100th rep bro you're gonna see just the look on these athletes face most of them is just like oh sad i have to go back to that, <laughs> back to that <laughs> right. Right? Right? and i know that it's a different psychology because they're they're truly going to be out for blood trying to go to the mm -hmm. crossfit game at this point 
but my goodness, man, that's the hard turnaround, right? Is you drop that ball and then you know you got to come through that yeah. thing one more time, particularly for those 50 burpee box jump overs. Yeah, I think the, the big thing for an athlete when you look at this is trying to keep them motivated through the second set of 50 burpee box jump overs. Because when you look at something as simple as a burpee, burpees are never hard to do. In fact, at this level with these caliber of athletes is that they it's become a monostructural movement, right? It, it's not a push-up off the floor. It's not a jumping clap. It is, is basically... No different than saying we're putting a 400 meter run into Correct. this equation. Correct. You throw the box up in there as well. It's not high enough that these athletes have to overwork to do that. And folks, mo most of them are going to be as very streamlined as possible, staying low on the box, stepping off of the box to get on the other end. But just the monotony of 50 reps after doing a whole round of this, I think it, more physically than anything, the mental, I would say, discipline to stay on this because the example we gave earlier when we were looking at the shuttle runs bleeding time for a burpee box jump over if you just have a second of hesitation we've lost a minute and where after this can you gain a minute on somebody i know it says 100 wall ball shots but like if me and you race 100 wall ball shots a minute is not going to separate us nope. no matter what really rep scheme or how hard we go so i almost think is after these burpee box jump overs you have you are have very limited opportunities to make up time after this, which may be that second set of fifty, maybe the most important fifty reps in this entire event. Yeah, and and I think with someone, you know, I think about going back and watching Matt Frazier and his dominance and his fittest. It's like that would be the moment where he's he's breaking the rope and pulling away from mm. the field. A lot of times, it's like the, it's that moment um, where it seems like oh, we're entering a part of the workout. This is super monotonous. We all know all the athletes are going to hold a really steady pace. Well, if you've got the fitness and you've gone onto that into this workout with the psychology of this is where I make my move, that is one of the strongest statements that an athlete can truly make to any anyone that's experienced it um, themselves uh, to, to that field. And I say that because it's like you know how much these athletes, no matter how slow or how fast they start, how much they're going to be suffering at that point. And you you hit the nail on the head, Chase, when I think you you said discipline. Um, because there has to be such internal dialogue and it has to be so strong, like your why and what's going on, the, the methods that you're using, how do you really turn off that, 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 that conversation in your mind, often an argument of I'm hurting, <laughs> this sucks. Like I can't speed up. I can't do this versus I have yes. to speed up. I'm going too slow, jump, step, drop, jump, step, drop, or whatever that mantra is. You have to be so strong in your why to be able to win with the positive and what's going to move you forward that that's where, you know, we're going to be watching some pretty boring burpee box jump overs, but it's going to be <laughs> a slug fest of a battle happening internally for every one of those athletes. Mm -hmm. I, I like what you said there and you touched on it as a, a negative topic uh, talk that I can't speed up, but in, in the reality of there, there's really a finite pace for these burpee box jump overs. So same thing for wall ball shots, right? You can only go so fast. And so the discipline stems beyond your ability to move well for 50 or 100 but again your ability to be okay with almost the tediousness of the 50 reps and what i see here is if we it, you know we're, we're trying to paint the picture for you guys of what these 50 feel like going into the second round is if we were doing say a trail run mm. th these 50 burpee box shift overs to me is that last hill that my job if i'm in the lead is i need to get over the crest of that hill before that person behind me so that, you know, if you crest a hill before someone, you have an opportunity to maybe break spirits. And I feel like it's the same thing here. But here's the hard part that we haven't even talked about. I, you know, we're talking about these things if you and me were going against each other. We ain't doing that. Right. You're right. in the confines of your own gym. So now, like, to me, it's really easy to be self-motivated if I'm trying to, say, catch you before the top of the hill or get to the double unders at the same time as you, Come or on. try to get to the wall with or the wall ball with within five reps of you. I don't know where you are. So we talked about discipline times that by 10, the discipline you have to have to be self-motivated enough to keep that pace, knowing no idea if it's the right pace, where you stack up against the rest of the field. And this is even good enough compared to what you think other people are doing. That's, that's the one thing we haven't even talked about yet. Yeah, and this is where it really pays to be have that cyborg type abilities, right? To kind of like shut off the noise, be really great at compartmentalizing and not be worried about the next double under or the 75th double under or the 100th wall ball and to be keyed in on the next burpee box jump over and getting to it 
at just the right time that you need to. Um, because, you know, you can't get caught up in looking around the gym here. You can't get caught up in worrying about how much time is left. It's you getting work done as fast as possible. And that's it. When we look at these four tests overall, when we want to say, okay, how is this test fit into deciding if these are the right two people to get to the cross the games based off of all these tests is that I feel like it's not just looking at these four by themselves because then you would say like, okay, well we're missing this balance and this balance. If we look at say the most balanced test overall, but what people need to consider is the tests that these athletes took to get here. And that's why we preface with quarterfinals, open semifinals is that this is a test that I feel like needs to be simple it needs to be designed in a way where, you know, we've said this before, who really does want it more? Who really does want to make the cross against? Because when you look at the skill sets, bar muscle ups, heavy thrusters, rowing, handstand walks, burpee box jump overs, wall ball shots, double unders, and a clean and jerk, there is nothing that's going to really out people unless they're just not the guy or the girl to make the game. So when you say 10 to 15 people that are all at the same level, the simplicity of the test based off what they've already been tested with is very important so that we don't out anyone specifically because of say a niche movement or niche event. Yes. I, and I completely agree. And I think we're seeing that here. I think the simplicity is the beauty of this test. You were getting a lot of work capacity, um, you know, and I would say in the form of metabolic conditioning, right, which is the base of our pyramid. And we've talked about this before. And then you get an opportunity to show how high your skill sets are in gymnastics with the handstand walk after the 2K. Then you get mm -hmm. to show where your local muscle endurance and overall general strength is with the thruster at 185, both when you're fresh and when you're fatigued. And then you also get that heavy clean and jerk rep after stinking rep after stinking rep. <laughs> And when you look at the totality of the test is that you can't point at these four and tell me whoever the two are that make it on the men and women weren't strong enough to be good or to make the cross at games. You can't look at whoever qualifies and say they aren't good enough gymnastics wise to qualify the, for the cross at games. You can't look at whoever comes out of these four events and say they don't have the work capacity or endurance to be displayed at the cross at games because it is all getting tested in this, even though it's just four events, three being couplets and one just being a triplet at the end. Yeah. And Hey, let's not forget. They all did the clean and jerk complex. They all did some form of repetitive barbell cycling. They all did a ton of legless rope climbs and other gymnastics modalities that were looked to and thought through before this test ever came to even this conversation between you and I. So I, I love it. I'm, I'm super pumped to watch these four workouts play out. Um, I got some folks in mind, but I, I could, Hey, who knows? Yeah. Well, who knows? before we get to our picks, because we are going to make our little bold predictions about who we think sh can advance based off these events, I have one more question for you because we did touch on the fact that these athletes are going to be basically in their home gym, their own environment. They get to really set things up perfectly for them, all within the floor plan that's designated by CrossFit. How important is environment going to be to dictate success for the athletes? Everything. It's, it's everything. It's, and, I, and I would even say that the preparation environment was everything leading to this point. And I know there's a handful of athletes that train alone and a handful of athletes that train in camps and a handful of athletes that are at their own gym but a very supportive community. I really think that the athletes who have had some of the most competition experience under their belt are going to have the greatest advantage in a lot of these instances because of that switch that you have to flip, uh, meaning that you might not be on the competition floor, but you are. And if you can relive that experience and remember what that was like and start to put it into a practical, uh, you know, application for this in-home gym experience, I think that you're going to have a lot more success. But for me, if I'm coaching someone through this last chance qualifier, I'm going to make sure there's a crowd there some people that are important to them are there if they're available, right? Like, and, and we're going to have times and heat set up so that they can thrive. And I don't think because it's against the rules, I'm going to have demo athletes demoing it like crazy right now. I'm going to be mm -hmm. reaching out and sending text messages and making calls like, Hey, I need you to do this workout as fast as you can. Let me know how you break it up. I want you to try this workout this way for me real quick. Right? Because all of that stuff is what all, all these athletes are doing right now in droves to give themselves the greatest advantage possible 
which we can talk about in later, but that ain't going to happen at the CrossFit Games. You're going to get a workout and go take the floor and good luck to you, right? <laughs> right. Environment is a whole different beast when we talk about the CrossFit Games, which we will get to later down the road in late July before the games go down in August. But before we get there, we have two men and two women that are on the verge of their last chance to qualify for the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. If we go, um, you want to go men first or women first? Uh, hey man, I'm I'm open. Yeah, I'm I open either. I feel like I feel like I like my. I'm gonna go women last because I feel like that one's just. That's just. I mean, they're both a buzz saw when you get into it. They but, really uh, are. On the men's side, <clears throat> you have this this whole list of athletes that are gonna get through, and you know it's it's uh, it's funny. It's like I'll go down the list and be like, oh yeah, that uh, that guy will get, and then I'm like, oh but. So will that guy. <laughs> so will that guy. So being as uh, – uh, yeah. all right, we'll go men first. Let's get it. Uh, uh, let's see. You go first, man. I'll go first, women. How about that? Yeah, that's or great. Or if you're going to flip. Okay, great. you yeah, all right. Hey, man. Here's the I'm going to – man, I don't know if I want to do the whole, like, if you take who I think, I got to pick a new one. You want to do that? <laughs> oh, I mean, I'll say we just see right. our picks, you know what I mean? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see what it is. Okay. <laughs> that, that way the people just get our just get our assumptions. We, we yeah. never know. So, okay, on the men's side, I'll preface it with this. I, I think that, you know, I, I got an opportunity. I, I, I did my best to be a part of every semifinal in some way, like viewing from my house, doing mm -hmm. a little bit of research, watching. Of course, I was doing it from the greedy perspective of, wow, I, I got to get ready to commentate this thing and, you know, <laughs> be, be as professional as possible. And, um, with what I saw uh, on, on the floor and what I see as this test, the two men that I have is Tim Paulson, mm -hmm. um, who I think really had a, a pretty darn good weekend at Granite Games and was just on the outside looking in with a couple errors that, that kept him out um, from what I saw. And then Tyler Christoffel. Ooh. Um, I, I really right. like the, the modalities that have been selected here. Uh, I, from knowing where he's at camp wise and who he trains with, I really like what they do and how they do it pretty darn often, um, for this, this, this test to play out. Um, and I think one of the things that got Tyler a little bit at that semifinal from an outsider's perspective and not knowing a ton about him personally was, um, the moment of that final workout. I think the moment got, mm -hmm. a, got him a bit. And I think him being able to do this in in the home of of wherever he's at probably still down in, in cookville uh, i think that'll lend to his advantage i like those picks i like those picks that uh, so on the men's side i also have tim paulson okay and i just Daddy uh, Tim. After, hey after what we saw at granite games the guy can row the dude is strong strong gymnastics are on point his handstand walks he went out, did, he wins event one. That's heavy thrust or uh, high intensity thrusters and handstand walks under pretty much the most fatigue you could put yourself into when it comes to that. So I think uh, there's there's about three events that really, really wheelhouse for him. And then I, I'm going to go out on the limb here. Yes. I'm going to say we're going to have a granite game sweep of the boys. Matt DeLugos. Matty D. Matty D out there. I like Listen, it. You can put the pull-up bar height wherever you want, bro. It's your gym. And you're going to tell me that boy can't handle a barbell and do some bar muscle-ups or do some damage with some clean and jerks? Or uh, the, Not a problem. This guy has been a – this guy has won every online rowing event for the last two years when it comes to quarterfinals. He won the row wall ball one, and he won the clean and jerk. Uh, the, sorry, the uh, the final and last quarterfinals. And to get a win, not to say he's going to get one, right? But to get a first place yeah. finish in yeah. four is a huge, huge, huge advantage. And then you look at event four. Tell me oh, who. Yeah. Tell me who. Tell me who's going to beat him. Yep. This dude's gonna. This guy did 120 wall ball shots and then 120 cal row at a pace I can't row 120 cals without the wall ball shot. <laughs> hey, 
Yeah. That <laughs> says many people in the world, of course, because yeah, right. Rogers, he's one of the greatest <laughs> men in the world. I so love those you know, Yeah. And if, you know, like Vic, there's a lot of guys that got a chip. Christopher's one of them, right? You, you, you got a bad taste in your mouth. You, you tasted glory and it was taken away from you in one event. Sprague was one of those guys too. I think I just think it's too heavy for Sprague at, the, at this point in time in his, in his career. But if anyone's got something to prove, I think of this whole list, it's, it's Matt DeLugos because the whole, the whole co conversation that we've put on him, right? Yeah. He has not come out and said no. this, right? We've put on him that we think he should have, he would have gone if the pull up bar and the rings were higher. We've said that. Right. And I still stand by that, but he hasn't. No, he didn't even raise his hand to get him. To get, he didn't even complain on site. No, didn't complain. Him and Justin didn't raise their hand. Right. And that's what I love about it and why it even is a poignant topic to make is because, you know, man, when you move in silence like that and you know it offends you or could affect your performance, like that's what makes you more dangerous because you're dismissing that and still trying to find a way to make it happen. And I, I love that point because of that. All right. Moving toward to the women. We have, golly, this is, this is no, this isn't, isn't e easier whatsoever. All right. I'm going first. Get it. Get it. Man, just because she kills it on online competition when she's healthy, she had the benefit of going in week one and she's been sitting in Georgia oh. waiting for it. Her chance, I'm gonna say Sarah Sigmund's daughter is punching a ticket to the cross it game. I wouldn't it just look like brute work? That's Sarah's game. There, there's nothing in here that's tricky. And with Maxell Hodge and that whole crew, when we talk about environment and someone who rides the emotional wave in the environment in which she's in, I can't see a much better environment for Sarah than what training think tank is gonna put around her for the last chance qualifier. And then uh, I'm going to go wild card again. She missed it by four points also in week one. And that was only because they took three. Maddie Sturt. I'm going to put Maddie out there. I got two Maddies going to the CrossFit games. One, one on the men's side. One on the women's side, but Maddie Sturt missed the cross games by four points in a region that should be taking five athletes to the games anyways. And when you look at her events across the board, she got fifth, seventh, fifth, seventh, fourth, and third and missed the CrossFit games in a region that had two spots already spoken for because one is the greatest CrossFitter to ever step on the competition floor with Tia Claire Toomey, and two was the only girl to almost beat her in competition legitimately in Cara Saunders. So I'm going to say Maddie Sturt rounds out my top two. Oh, what pick, man. I'm going to go first on this one. I tell you. <laughs> What's that? I said, I'm glad I got to go first on this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I, and I, and I, I honestly really love your picks. And, and it's eerie how similar we are, you know. Okay. Um, so so I, I, I love it. I love it. I am going to lead with the person that we have in common. Ooh. Which, is someone who is venturing back from injury, who went mm -hmm. week one, and who has been down there just fuming in Georgia with a team, which is a huge aspect of this. Like I think you mentioned where they're in such a competition-driven atmosphere right now, gaining weeks of experience in events just like this. If, if, if people are watching, if they're students of the game like we are, you can go on YouTube and find this type of thing, you know, that training think tank They're they're logging and sharing some of these competitions and to see this, the work that she's put in and the things that she's done. Sarah Sigmund's daughter, when I looked at these workouts, was one of the first names that popped into my head, like, okay, she has opportunity here. And I'll tell you, Chase, the thing that made me slightly reconsider uh, putting her mm. there was the fact that there's a lot of um, hidden bounding in this, in this test, in this, uh, yeah, in this, yes. you know, these tests. So we, we've got the burpee box jump overs, the double unders aren't in high volume, but they're there and, and they're there in an annoying thing, an annoying volume with the burpee box jump overs just before you get to that wall ball. Right. And then the running is still that unilateral contraction and it's a bound. And then even the clean and jerk start to turn into that, 
the way that you kind of drive your hips open, receive the bar, and then have to get it ready for the jerk each and every rep. There's almost like a slight hop or bounce. And if you guys have been following Chase and I's discussions all season long, we know that like, hey, double unders haven't been a problem by themselves for Sarah, but it seems like they create a hang up in the ladder movements that are involved or the movements that are affected by their their existence and running similarly. So that was the only thing. That's the one thing that's like, okay, there's a lot of that though. Hopefully she's had time to get those right. Um, and then I'll, and then I'll jump into my second one. My, my second one is a wild card. A lot, a lot, a lot similar to you, Chase. This would be a rookie at the CrossFit games. She also, she also missed by four, five points. points. And I believe that you, that you were there to cover her event live of an average of seventh, seventh place finish where she went seventh, seventh, fourth, sixth, sixth, seventh. And this is a miss Chloe Wilson. Oh, Granite Games represent, man. Who is also (laughs) a firefighter. So oh. I, I went with Chloe, man. And I, and I couldn't think I, I I've got some history with Chloe. I remember seeing her as a 16, 17 year old coming into a CrossFit space at you CrossFit Salt Lake city way down back in the day where she couldn't do a ring mm-hmm. muscle up. But guess what? Her stinking strength and general fitness was so high at that point. I was like, Oh, she's going to be a problem. You know, if she stays with this, she made the decision to go and, and serve us in a community here as a firefighter. And uh, she's still pretty darn fit and she's still doing a thing. And I like these workouts for her because of that and the way that they play out throughout the four and particularly even in the order. I like that pick. I like that pick. Just, just a taste of it. And I mean, a lot of our runner ups were just that those fifth place, sixth place finishers. Yep. Very close on the outside looking in, you know, you get into a competitive atmosphere there, and there's so many of these, right? Like, and this is, this is in you and I's defense. It's like, look at this list. How you pick two? How you do that? <laughs> I just close my eyes and I put my finger on the screen. I'm like, Oh, it's, it's uh, <laughs> that's that person has a shot too. Uh, yeah. Bro, we're having these conversations. I'm at vacation here. Right. My brother-in-law's like, so who's your top three men and women for the games this year? And I'm just hiding behind the fact that, like, well, this is first. Let me make sure I got the whole field, yeah. right? Because it's just so hard for me to just <laughs> yeah. fit it out. I've got to really take my time and do some thinking. So maybe by the end of, like, this five-day trip, I'll have an idea. But before that, man, I'm like, don't ask yeah. me questions like that. It takes me too long. Well, there you have it, folks. Those are our picks. What do you, so Adrian's got who are your, your, your top two men? Who so are my top two men were, were Tim Paulson and Tyler Christoffel. And then mm-hmm. my top two ladies were Sarah Sigmund's daughter and Chloe Wilson. All right. And myself, I have Tim Paulson as well, but Matt DeLugo. So two Granite Games athletes on the men's side. And then I'm also going with Sarah Sigmund's daughter and throwing out Maddie Sturt as an opportunity to get herself those four points back that she lost week one in Australia. But that'll do it for us here because the last chance qualifier kicks off on Wednesday at noon Pacific time, of which will have a 24 wind hour window to get the first two events in and another 24. And then by Friday, unofficially, it'll all be said and done. And we'll see how close we got. And when it all is set, we'll come back and either say, I told you so, or, uh, you know, maybe we're looking for new analysts for the next <laughs> games <laughs> season. But uh, Adrian, thank you for taking the time. I know you're on your vacation, so I appreciate that. You go back and enjoy your time with your family. And all you athletes that are about to take on the last chance qualifier, those were our picks. But good luck to each and every one of you. We hope you guys have a very healthy yet intense last chance qualifier. Good luck, everyone. We'll see you guys when it's over.